Assalamu alaikum, Editor family. Welcome to live chat number 39. Here's the book for us today for you The Antiquities of Sin, phenomenal book reprinted by EFT, available in the market in Karachi, a must own for anybody interested in the heritage, culture, architecture of Sin and its ancient wisdom in its buildings. So, today's guest is a really important person in my life. I've known him since I was 16. Whew, that's a long time, many, many years. Um, and actually, you know, he, I have to say, is somebody who has shown me how one can look at an alternative thought for life. He introduced me to jazz, he explained to me how it worked, its history, to blues, to how there's an alternative art world out there beyond the mainstream colonial education that we suffer with and live our lives in servitude to. So here's our guest for today. He has lived in many parts of the world. He knows his Chinese extremely well. He knows his Buddhism extremely well. Um, I remember from school an excellent painter, excellent at all his studies, really a Renaissance man, an excellent cook, bakes really well plays music without any sheet music required, absolutely phenomenal human being, great sense of humor. He's lived all over the world from Myanmar to Pakistan, uh, of course from his own UK home. Uh, he's the one who came to visit me in New York when I was there and said, wow Zan, it feels like a medieval city. And sure enough that stuck in my head. Let me introduce you, he's here to a dear friend and an extremely powerful energy source, Will Buckingham, who is joining us from Sofia, Bulgaria. Let me bring him on board. Will, so good to see you here. Thank you for your time. He should be joining us any minute after that introduction. Well, hello, uh, Zen, and hello, everybody. I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Okay, this worked yesterday. No sound. No sound. Okay. Um, we tested this on your iPad the other day. This is on the i. This is on the iPad. This is on the iPad. Yeah. The iPad had worked. It had um, worked. I, I don't know if anybody else can hear you, but I can't hear you. Okay. Wait a sec. Okay, that's better. Now I've. How's that? Can you hear me? Can you see me? I can hear him, Gene Gardner says. This is a good sign. We want to hear him. How's that? Will? Is that any better? Let's yeah. hear you recite some Urdu poetry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's uh, super. How's that I was kidding you were the other day, but I can hear you, which is terrific. You can hear me. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Right, good. Oh, so I hope I didn't miss anything out in your introduction. I think I did miss. I missed out on the fact that you're a prolific writer. It was a, an immensely generous introduction. And also, I'm kind of jealous now because you were talking about the antiquities of Sindh. And I, I have to get that book. But um, it, potentially, it's going to be hard to track down here in Sofia. <laughs> I'll send it to you if it's uh, safe via snail mail. I'll buy. It. I'll send you a copy. That's easy. Oh, how exciting! Wonderful. <coughs> we can arrange that. So, listen, Will. You've been. You've had a look at our um, previous chats. This is chat number thirty-nine, as you know. And um, you know, it's a nice time for you to be joining us because we've already hashed through the insensitivities and the ravages of colonialism, not only in the subcontinent, but in Southeast Asia, all the way to Vietnam, etc. We've talked about the maps and how the Silk Road connects us through food, through music. Uh, Nurul Khan, an architect from Dhaka, talked about it, how food is such an essential part. Um, Joy talked about it. I know you're a great foodie, so it means, makes sense to you and how the trade route from Mongolia to where you're at, in fact, all the way up to Sofia, Bulgaria, to the Baltics, has actually had a connection to the Indus. 
<clears throat> with the Mughals, you've been here. So I'm not going to ask you to rehash any of that because that would be a waste of your time. You've already seen, we've been discussing it, right, Will? So my question for you is having lived in so many different places and having experienced the remnants of the colonization, whether it's Myanmar or Pakistan or India, um, and having you know, lived in the UK, you, and you travel, you're living in someplace new almost every few months. You know, sometimes you're in China. I think you've, been, you've lived in Vietnam or Cambodia at some point in your life also. Indonesia, um, yeah. In Indonesia, close enough. So mm -hmm. what, what do you think, what, I mean, you, you know, we, we have all these lost yes. histories thanks to our Western education in all of these countries, right? So how do you think we could revive the, the lost and shared histories amongst all of us because of the trade routes? And how do you think one could recreate this experiential learning uh, that I've been doing on my editors? I mean, I just, I want to get kind of like a reflective feedback on you think on these things. Like, how do we take this forward? Okay, yeah. Well, that's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of questions. Um, Sorry. I think the first, the kind of first thing that comes to mind is it's really easy to talk about the sort of um, the remnants of colonialism as if it's something that's already collapsed <coughs> uh, and you know there's just a few few ruins sitting around. But it's increasingly clear to me that that's not the case. So we're still, to a large extent, living within it. And you can see that, I mean, you can see that politically um, with what's yeah. been going on in the UK, um, Black Lives Matter. You can see that also yeah. somewhere like Myanmar, where I was recently, where the, the whole kind of structure of, um, of the society and the kind of problems that people are having day to day are not, I mean, it is the remnants of colonialism, but that suggests that it's something slightly dead rather than something that is still kind of having a huge, a huge effect on people's lives. I mean, I'm still speaking to you in English. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you wouldn't want to speak to me in my terrible Urdu, um, <laughs> which I can remember like three words. <laughs> but listen, so why not? Why, why should I not speak to you in Urdu? And you mm -hmm. speak in English, but should mm -hmm. there not be a mechanism between us to understand each other's languages? I mean, you work with language day in and day out and you're communicating and you're expressing, whether it's philosophy or Chinese philosophy or something that's humorous. <clears throat> why, why, why does it have to be in English? You also paint really well. I've not painted for a long time. Um, I mean, I think all of these things are kind of channels <coughs> of communication. And one of the things I think is, I was, we were talking to a friend here in Bulgaria today about language, and my Bulgarian is still very basic. Um, and sometimes, you know, if I'm out in some village somewhere and there's a, there's a Bulgarian grandmother and, you know, she's chatting and, you know, uh, talking, to, talking away. And even though my Bulgarian is very bad and we're kind of talking in Bulgarian, or even if there's not very little language shared at all, you come away and then the day after you think, wow, that was a huge conversation we had. Um, and then you think, well, how can we ha have had that conversation? <laughs> Because, you know, I don't have the words, I don't have the vocabulary. Um, but somehow, you know, human beings are natural connectors. And that urge to communicate and connect does, you know, does break through where you wouldn't necessarily think it would. So one of the things I really like, actually, I really like being out of my depth linguistically. Mm. You know, I can, I can do English. Um, I've been doing it all my life, but there's something just really appealing about it. language becomes difficult. And when you're out of your depth and you have to struggle to find other ways to communicate and to, and to connect with the person in front of you. So interesting that in, in, in many ways, what you're saying is that the linear language fails and the intuitive circumstantial experiential language uh, gestures that are innate to all of us cross-culturally uh, that sit back that we all carry from our great-grandparents even the lady you're talking about had some 
thoughts in her mind of how she could bridge the gap with you in in, in a non English manner. So mm -hmm. those several other modes of expression then take over when ling li linear language falls short, which, as you're saying, falls short quite often. And I, you know that for me is what's interesting because in the digital age, as we are blurring these cultural boundaries while also trying to maintain our identity, there is a what you call it you call an urge. I I refer to as a desire, you know, a curiosity to connect, to communicate, to to find out more about the other because somehow or the other we are actually interconnected. So that differentiation that seems so obvious actually isn't in my mind. You think yeah. the other modes of communication and language does that to it sort of, it connects us all beyond the language. I think, I think we can, you can overestimate <coughs> how, um, how much work language is doing when you're communicating and how much work is being done by other things. Um, you know, which I, I think is fairly sort of, it's kind of fairly well understood, but um, I find it in terms of um, speaking. Well, here's an interesting thing. I mean, in when I was learning Chinese, I got very frustrated because I'd been learning really you know, seriously for quite a long time, and still I'd listen to Chinese and I think I can't understand it, you know any conversations I can hear. And I was in China and I'd be sitting on the train and think, well, I can't understand anybody. But then I got back to the UK and I was sitting on the bus and um, I was listening to the people behind me and they were English speakers. Um, and I realized that I only understood about 70% of what they were saying. Wow. But I didn't have, because actually, you know, um, we don't pick up on that much. And without, they were sitting behind me as well because I couldn't see them gesturing and they're, face-to-face -face thing and you know yeah, there's sort of, like end of a smil smiling and nodding and I didn't have <laughs> all of that so I kind of didn't get that much of the conversation and so I realized that my idea that in English I have 100% comprehension and that that should be my goal in other languages was kind of nonsense because none of us have 100% comprehension in, in any language really I think um, yeah so, so, I just find that really interesting. So, Will, if I say that all the words are written in Urdu, I will do it in Urdu, so if you look at my face, my hands, my gestures, what do you understand? Just listen to my voice. In these two words, if I say all the words in Urdu, what do you understand? Urdu is very difficult. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. You kind of get some kind of sense and some kind of meaning. And if we'd, um, you know, with my four or five words, I still remember, <coughs> if we'd gone over again, we didn't have any other channel to communicate, we would get there. So just in general, to our, satis our people's satisfaction. What did yeah. you think I was saying to you right now? What was, what was your feeling from that? I'll tell you what I said, but I'm just curious to know. Yeah. I know your Urdu is rusty and this is throwing you in the deep end, but I'm just curious because you, you have a very, very fine finely tuned ear uh, for sound. So I'm just curious to know, what, what would you make of what I just said to you? Um, what did it sound okay. like saying? So several interesting things were happening. The first thing was, um, it was several seconds before I realized you switched. <laughs> That's so interesting. At first, so at first I was just thinking, oh yeah, I can understand this. And it's like, oh my God. Um, uh, he's putting a trick on me, you know. Um, this is this is, is why then um, this is and um, oh, this is Urdu. This sounds like Urdu. Okay, yeah, fine. So there was that kind of switch, and then what there was, <clears throat> there were a couple of moments where I was thinking, oh, wait a minute, I could get this. Um, and then what came in, which was also interesting, was this sort of mass, mass rising panic. Um, that uh, uh, oh my god. I'm here. Um, I'm here on you know live on Instagram, and um, Zen is talking to me in Urdu, and he's given me this immensely generous introduction. And then the the, um, the people who've joined the talk are um, going to recognise that you know I'm an absolute fraud. And then the panic came in, 
and the panic <laughs> then gets in the way of the attention to actually the communication. So I don't know what you were saying, but what I was, what I'm interested by is the kind of that weird sort of transforming psychological pattern as, as I was listening and that move from, <laughs> oh, I can understand this, this is English, oh no, it's Urdu, to, ah, oh, oh, maybe I, I probably could understand some of this, to, oh my God, I'm live on Instagram, panic, and then the kind of shutters come down. So there's that kind of interesting, um, all those other interesting sort of dynamics, which are part of everyday conversation as well, I think. So I'll, come back to English. I'll, I'll come back to English so I can explain that to you. Yeah. Uh, what I essentially, what I essentially, it's not very interesting what I said, to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, what I said was basically that, well, if I continue this conversation in Urdu, how much yeah. of it would make sense to you? And, and your response is beautiful because it's not about whether I make sense or not, because for me, I'm mm -hmm. making sense, but I've, I've unfortunately sent you into the realm of fear. And like you said, mm -hmm. your system is shut down. Now yeah. that's only because you're in a public space and you're feeling a little bit uh, gawked at. But okay. if we were, um, uh, yeah, that's my mother, I think. If you oh. were, um, yeah. um, if if you were have if you had to buy bread, let's say, you know, we're on the Silk Route. I said this to <laughs> Noor that I met you at a caravan sarai in Kabul, and we're two random strangers. We're heading north, so we're just going to backpack together, and we didn't speak each other's language. Right at that point, you're not being gawked at. Then we'd have to find a common ground. Yeah. Or if you had to buy bread at that same caravan sarai, and they only spoke Uzbek whatever language mm -hmm. they spoke back then. So, you know, like language is something really important because language is going to somehow have to find a middle ground post pandemic as we mm -hmm. move into the world of Zoom and the digital environments and try and figure out how do we bring back the touch and feel, right? I mean, this yeah. is wonderful. So I'm, I could have said all of this to you from, yeah, behind the bar, be, sitting behind you, but it's so wonderful that with two hour time difference, we're sitting in the same little screen together. I'm in your room, you're in mine. And we haven't been together in a space, Will, in years. Last time I saw you was- London, I, years ago. 20 years ago in London. Um, no, 11 20 years. 2010, I think 2010. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Because that's the last time I was in the UK, I came to attend a friend of Chris's mm -hmm. wedding. So that's, uh, okay. we met for lunch. I haven't seen you since. And the time uh -huh. before that was, New York. Uh, New York, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, this is quite wonderful. Now, you and I could do this every week. And we see each other. We see our expressions. We hear, I could help you practice <laughs> your Urdu. But you, yeah, I mean, yeah, you need yeah. Urdu desperately in Sofia. You know that, right? I mean, your I, life I, is I, so I, much I, easier if you spoke fluent Urdu in Bulgaria. Urdu, I need Bulgarian. I need Arabic. You know, I need Roma. I need all kinds of languages. But yeah, Turkish. So, interesting. Thing, there's, there's a great... Yeah, um, go ahead. I've got a friend here who's a American folklorist um, <clears throat> and um, called Sarah Craycraft. And she's fabulous and she spends a lot of time in villages kind of um, studying folklore. <clears throat> and she was up on the border with Serbia and um, Romania. And there they speak, she speaks quite good Bulgarian, better than mine, but it's a, up in the borderlands by Romania, they speak a mixture of Bulgarian and Serbian and Vlach. So the local, the local kind of uh, dialect is very difficult. Right. And she was staying in the, sorry. So she was staying in the house of a um, of an old lady called Baba Checha, and Baba Checha was talking to her and talking to her and talking to her like you were to me, and um, and she was like, "This is crazy Bulgarian. This isn't normal standard Bulgarian, you know, textbook Bulgarian." And she said, "Baba Checha, you know when you talk to me." Um, I can't understand. And the grandmother stopped and she looked at her and she said, but Sarah, the important thing isn't that you understand. The important thing is that we're communicating. And I think yes. that's a really beautiful distinction. Um, yeah. So that, that's, that's basically what I was trying to do is, um, so you know, the communication um, today when we're looking at somebody from China, from Hong Kong, Singapore, who don't, whose English is weak, you know, I think it's unfair for us to expect anybody coming onto the digital platform post pandemic, where that is the new reality. And it is a world that's going to have to be developed by uh, people like you, 
that to expect everybody to have a decent control of the English language is unfair. And why English versus Bulgarian or yeah. Russian? You know, Russian is a beautiful language. If you remember, I studied Russian in, in, at boarding school. You remember those years? While everybody else was doing yeah. French and German, I did Russian and Spanish. Yeah. And Russian is a beautiful yeah, language. Yeah. So, you know, the language issue is really important. And you've lived, I mean, what was language like for you when you were wandering through Pakistan versus Myanmar? Um, so I mean, your Urdu I mean, Pakistan was that long great time when ago. you were in Pakistan. How did you get by? Hmm? Sorry. I, it, was, it wasn't that great. Um, I got by partly because people were immensely patient, immensely kind, immensely generous, and immensely hospitable. Um, and um, I, was, I was 18, so I was also immensely naive. And, you know, sometimes a good dose of naivety gets you gets you a long way um so if yes. i survived in pakistan yes. as, and thrived in pakistan as i did um traveling around tiny i remember you saying my god really i wouldn't go to those places but you know tiny tiny I towns know. crazy staying in hotels staying in hotels that were 10 rupees a night um but people were just incredibly incredibly kind to me um and so I survived because I put my faith in other people, really. Um, in Myanmar, I spoke um, better Burmese, I think. I worked harder on my Burmese and I had more of a sense of what it meant to learn languages by then. Um, so, but still, again, um, you know, you, you get by, the, you don't have the tools to say what you want, so you have to say something else. And there's something about having experiencing difficulties in language that does force a kind of creativity on you as well, which I, I like. But yeah, to, come back to, your that's, point, that's... to come back to your point, to come back to your point about the global sort of, the global platform, the global language of English, I think you're absolutely right in the way that English has this kind of dominance. Um, and it's, you know, it's a huge, it's a huge ask or expectation that other people should just be able to be comfortable with that. Um, and one thing I think native English speakers who don't speak other languages as well should get used to is the kind of ordinary human discomfort of living in a sort of post English, post English world, if you like, that would do that would do people like me a lot of good. Um, my fellow, my, my fellow, um, you know, British, British citizens, I think, who are monoglots. So, you know, we have um, in, um, in Pakistan today, since I've, since I've come back, I found that this is something that's really evolved a lot, which is Minglish. So Minglish <laughs> is Urdu and English mixed, because as you know, thanks to our colonial hangover, need, none of us, not none of us, majority of us, not only have a weak handle of Urdu, but an equally weak handle of English. There's very few of us can, that can really say that their Urdu is strong and so is their English. So they, when the vocabulary falls short in one language, you drop in a word from the other. So there's this yo-yo that happens in the language. So I will speak to you in a sentence of English, or make kuch Urdu bhi ho jayegi, and then I'll come back to the English, and then Urdu ka khana bhi aajayega, and pyaas bhi lag jayegi, and then there'll be some water, and pani ka glass, water ka glass de do will, you know, that sort of thing will happen in between. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's fine, because you, you understood all of what I just said, and can you give me a glass of water, please, Will? Mm -hmm. But I, is, there, is there a potential for that becoming more universal, not Minglish, but a space that allows you to throw in some Russian and some Spanish and some Bulgarian and some Burmese, some uh, Chinese, some Japanese. I mean, what would that end up being like? I mean, Urdu is a bit like that, by the way. So it's a mixture yeah, of Sanskrit, of course, yeah. Arabic, Farsi, right? Yeah, camp so yeah, if, yeah. if we scale that up, there's a lot of people all the way from Turkey to, to Bangladesh, which is the edge of Myanmar, essentially, right? Even in mm -hmm. Nepal, so there's, if I yeah. listen to them, because a lot of it is a Hindi-Urdu hybrid, and Turkish has Urdu in it, Persian, Farsi has Urdu in it, Arabic obviously does. So Urdu gets us by the Near East all the way across the subcontinent till we hit, hit Southeast Asia. 
So, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of land mass covered by, you know, one very modern language. Why can we not create a hybrid like that for more people? Well, there's just, there's a wee connection connection issue. I'm just waiting for you. Okay, I'm back. So you, you'll have to repeat that. I did, you, did you hear that? I, I, the connection, connection seems, seems okay now, but I missed the last bit. So you were talking about Urdu getting you by yeah. all the way from sort of Pakistan, all the way up to sort of the, yeah. you know, so I, was, I, just, I was just wondering, that, can we not create a hybrid like that for um, the post-pandemic digital world? Can we not create another language that is not English? Because I think English really represents shackles for a lot of cultures, especially this region. Uh, cultures that, that have been uh, invaded and colonized. And even if it's not English, you know, even the Vietnamese will think about English like they do about the French, and the Goanese will think about English as they think about Spanish. So it's, it's a representation of a colonial past, you know, like you said, which is still alive, really. So what do you think? Can we, can we not create a hybrid of something else that's more inclusive? I think, I mean, it's a, it's a really nice idea. I love those. I do love those hybrids and I love all that code switching. Um, yeah. So when, you know, when you're um, hanging out with Chinese speaker friends, um, there's quite a lot of that. And in Myanmar, I had a friend who I traveled with who spoke Indonesian, which I speak to some extent, and Chinese and English. And we kind of spoke some weird mix of the three. Um, mm -hmm. and, there's, and there's a pleasure to that. And there's, I like the way you can play with language and the flexibility. The difficulty is, I think, with um, consciously creating something. So language is such an organic thing. Um, and all of these kind of... Or get organic changes to language are fantastic, but I mean Esperanto is a good example of a you know consciously created language, but it's not become obviously what the creators of Esperanto hoped it would become. So you could try whether people would be able to would end up speaking it or not, um, or whether actually there's something more intimate about the way that people create and recreate language um, so that you can't necessarily create through a sort of act, act of creation, but you just have to let it emerge. What about characters? What do you think about characters? What, uh, what characters? What kind of characters? You know, you know yesterday, really yesterday I read an article posted actually by somebody I follow on Instagram called Ancient Pakistan. And ancient mm. Pakistan does some incredible research on the kinds of things that we're talking about, except I don't take time out to do the research mm. um, as much and in as great a depth. But they posted an article on how similar hieroglyphics have been found in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, and in the Indus Valley civilization. And interestingly enough, next week, I'm in Mehergar in Balochistan to go and look oh, at wonderful. these things. Mm -hmm. So my next Thursday's uh, broadcast is actually going to be from, from Quetta, most likely. So, ah. I mean, what if we were to change from linear language to, I guess, a kind of like emoji language, right? Characters, emojis are characters, right? There's no linguistic I mean, chain holding yeah. them down. I mean, I think emojis are a really good example, actually, because they're a... Um, you know, they're a sort of cross-linguistic... Cross um, kind of um, kind of mode of communication, and it, you know occasionally yep. I mean, it's uh, you have that challenge. You know, can you translate this short story into emoji? And you can kind of do it. You know, kind of do it, not quite. But um, and obviously there's um, there's emojis. There's also you know gifs. There's also if you use uh, Chinese social media, you know the kind of crazy stickers you can use on WeChat. And there's all of these other kind of modes of communication. I was sending you emojis earlier um, when we were setting up this talk. And um, <laughs> I, I, love all, I love all that stuff. Um, 
and I know there are certain sort of uh, sort of scholarly academic types who who see it as trivialising, but it's all it's all communication. So yeah, um, but there's I suppose there's the two different things of written language and spoken language as well, um, and. One nice thing about emojis is you can create create something in written language, even if you don't share any spoken language at all. Right. I mean, I wonder if written language is going to become not obsolete, but almost just for the intelligentsia, right? So the written language will, will, be, will become like Morse code, because that you really have to know, and only special people will know the written language, while the rest of us billions of people will just uh, be throwing emojis at each other and getting by very quickly. So, you know, Farooq has just shared an emoji of a space with these dark glasses on with the Ray-Bans and um, uh, the Wayfarers, sorry, I wear Ray-Bans that Calvin broke the other day. But, you know, it, worldwide, this is the sign for Mr. Cool, right? That this is such a, so it's a cool idea or it's somebody who thinks they're very cool or they're sending you a compliment of being cool. So what I like about the emojis is that there's multiple ways of interpreting them close enough to what the essential interpretation is, essential messages. But the written word is much more surgical. Mm -hmm. This is hot food. Yeah. The, um, I mean, I think one thing that's interesting about the written word is how it's really tied up with bureaucracy. And it was from ancient Sumeria, um, you know, down to the present. And actually the demand that we, so there is the idea, is it Walter Wrong, isn't it? And the idea that we might be, yeah. he was writing in the, in the 80s, was it? Entering an era of secondary orality. Um, and it was obviously before the internet and before all of that. But this idea that mass media Our yes. are returning us back to this kind of oral culture which I kind of find appealing, but also the written word doesn't go away because the kind of bureaucracies and mechanisms of control and the, the forms you have to fill in to be a legitimate human being all demand high levels of skill in writing um, and emojis are banned in that, in that kind of sphere. Um, so I'm not sure that, I think kind of written language is here to stay because the way our societies are organized has a kind of bureaucratic um, basis of control and written language is really important for that. So you have just basically said that written language is going to be the control mechanism uh, for bureau bureaucracy, for governance, and for a kind of fascist control over society, whilst the oral traditions may come out may come back out through the emoji culture and through sign language and characters like the Sumerians, like the Egyptians and uh, the Indus Valians. So, I mean, do you think there's room? Should, should we bring oral cultures back? The oral history and, you know, we've lost so many stories, Will, so much history is lost because it wasn't written down, especially in this region. And it's only our yeah. grandparents that have them. And, you know, they will still share stories with their children, and, you know, the stories are inherited and they come down the generations. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not sort of um, taking such a hard line as that on, on written language. <laughs> I'm a writer. Um, and yes. um, if I thought that just writing was just a method of fascist control, as you say, then I would either have to give up or um, you know, start questioning myself about why I was writing. So I did, and you were talking about this, or you know, preserving oral culture through writing and the way that stories can be, you know, if you write something down or record it in some other way, then you can, a hundred years later, you can read it or somebody across the other side of the planet can read it. So there is, um, uh, there is a value for writing. So my point there is kind of more, I think, that it's in the interests of the way that our societies work to maintain writing as a as a formal practice because we you know we have um, bureaucratic kind of um, mechanisms that we're all a part of and writing is very strongly a part of that but the oral thing i think is interesting because there is a sense in which there's more shared there's more 
flexibility in the kind of oral and oral like cultures than there was before all of this kind of you know zoom and uh, social media internet all of those technologies and that is kind of fun i mean radio as well tv all of that um i mean i think orality is going nowhere and writing is going nowhere actually um the question of the your initial question about some kind of lingua franca that can free people from the sort of the weight of you know western colonial past um mm. that people could then happily chat that's a kind of different question that's a that's an intriguing question um yeah but um uh, but i think but i think writing and writing and um and also kind of orality are both flourishing actually alongside each other i guess i'm um because you do write and i you know i've also heard you play music without having sheet music in front of you so i just wonder sometimes how come you didn't become a professional musician like a jazz musician versus a writer because i i feel like your sensitivities are so much more than being pinned down to the pen and paper um and i if so what you've said that look oral traditions not going anywhere writing is not going anywhere even if it becomes bureaucratic and fascist for filling out forms and making sure that you fulfill social uh, regulations um as a human in society in a community but i guess what i'm trying to say and i'm not really doing a great job at it is it's about documentation right so we want to communicate i have to impart certain bits of information to you somehow pictures mm -hmm. colors objects sounds gestures dances music to communicate whatever is you know even if you just want to buy or sell a piece of bread i may have to do a little jig to make you understand <laughs> what this bread making process yeah. was so you're like oh you're making bread and i'm like yeah and then i want to like hand it over to you so you know we communicate with animals they don't speak english they don't write english we communicate with ancient buildings and there's so much communication that happens they certainly don't write in english for me mm -hmm. and a lot of times you must have experienced this that qawwali you know the old the abda parveen music sometimes i don't understand the saraiki i don't understand yeah. the abdullah shah latif's poetry and you so but it moves you right it's emotive and and isn't is, that's kind of enough because today for instance there's a friend of mine is a lawyer and we were having a conversation about animal law there's been like mayhem these this last week boss yeah um yeah yeah you saw that yeah yeah i just anyway so uh what was i saying i've just not so gone to the youtube um so where are we where are we going um Baker's doing a little jig, um, Kawali, yeah, Abdul Parveen, so, that right, kind of direct attention. Yeah. So it was about. So I said to her that, look, today I've had a harrowing day, and what I would love right now, and this was at eleven in the morning, I'm having this conversation. What I would love is either a gin and tonic, or I would love to. It's Thursday. I would love to go to Seven Sharif to the shrine and attend the thamal. so there was yeah. such a desperate need to get out of one's body out of one's skin out of the collapse of civilization that i would either mm -hmm. get that at a shrine where i didn't understand the language it was probably just a bugle and the six drums uh, mm -hmm. but it's the the energy of the space and i didn't need a book to read to understand mm -hmm. that and the other option option also didn't have a book uh, written in english i mean it'd be such fun for you to write a book that was multilingual with emojis also in it in terms of like jazz so you just make it up <laughs> yeah, as you go along yeah. and destroy the english grammar completely destroy quote unquote mm -hmm. recreate mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think the uh, there is a kind of perception i think that something about the written word is less direct than something like you know mm -hmm. um a bit of a pain to take her as an example in full flow singing kawali you know and what could be more direct and sort of heart to heart right. than that um and to some extent i think the process is is not so direct but also and the process of producing writing is quite solitary 
so that's one of the one of the differences whereas once you're performing you have a direct face-to-face -face connection um if you're performing music and that's also why things like performance poetry are so big um because it actually lives in the person-to-person -person connection um which is where the sort of you know embodied beings come together to kind of um impact yeah. on each other and you know books um they kind of feel they can feel like dead things in in comparison um but like, but I'm not sure I wholly I hold to that sort of entirely to that idea that the the written word is the sort of most indirect form of communication. You don't think it um, is? No, and I'm not sure why I don't think that. Um, I've not thought thought it through, but as I've gone on writing, um, I sort of feel increasingly that it there is something. There is something quite direct about that. But I, I can't quite articulate that. Maybe if we have another chat in six months time, I'll be able to go, ah, oh, that's what I was talking about. Um, I mean, but yeah, just in writing, moment, I'm not sure. You've been writing for a long time. Here's somebody who's come to say hello. Please say hello. Um, <gasps> who's come to join in the chat. <laughs> Who are you? So this is one of my rescues. I have... I used to have eight, I now have six, and mm -hmm. he was found on the street in Karachi, Willie. Just imagine this gorgeous animal, oh, someone had just left. Yeah. So, and you know, we communicate, there's no books that we need between us. Um, yeah. You know, so funny thing, you also mentioned the hospitality that you experienced when you were mm. here, and you've recently written a book, Hello Stranger. Yeah. And this is about hospitality? It is, and so it's about how to, that we, we're all outnumbered by strangers. You know, the people who are, our circle of intimates is relatively small. The famous number is 150 people we can kind of keep tabs on. And there's eight billion, seven, eight billion people on the planet. So we're living on top of and amongst strangers all the time. How do you deal with that? Um, and that's the kind of initial question. And so the book's about, hospitality about how to be more welcoming to all strangers, how to cultivate cultures that are more open and welcoming, and how to deal with the sort of strangeness of being outnumbered and being in the midst of countless strangers um, who you don't know what they're doing, what they're up to, what they're thinking, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of what the book's about. Um, it's prompted by all kinds of political movements to do with, you know, anti-immigration movements in the UK and that kind of thing. But also just in terms of my own life and experience, the, the richness of those experiences of connecting with strangers across barriers, sometimes of language, as we've been talking, across barriers of culture, um, and finding that, finding that elusive well, not, not elusive even, finding that um, real and vivid human connection, um, uh, you know, in the, face of, in the face of our, sometimes our fear of strangers and sometimes our curiosity, depending on how it's going for us. So, so what, yeah. That's interesting. What is, I mean, for someone, I guess you and I have both lived, sorry, I'm just crossing my legs. You and I have yeah. both lived in all sorts of strange places and met all sorts of strange, creepy strangers and also mm -hmm. wonderful, magical strangers. Yeah. Um, of course, the creepy ones being more interesting in many ways. Uh, what, what is that definition? What are, we, what are we defining as a stranger? What is that? The, um, not us. Is that, is that all it is? It's just somebody not, not, not us. us. I mean, not us and somebody who's not... I think the, the kind of at the heart of it is the sense of unknowability or unpredictability. Um, so, I mean, arguably, arguably every other human being is a stranger to us. Um, but there are people we feel that there's a kind of degree of, the degree to which we know them and the degree to which they're predictable. 
And then there are people we just think, whoa, what's this? You know, who's this? And then somebody else comes and you think, oh, who's this? So it's that sense of unknowability and how you deal with the uncertainty of what you're being you know, presented with. Don't you think there are also times when um, there's a certain comfort in being in an environment which is filled with strangers? So um, there's a certain protection they provide and a certain comfort where you know something about them just by looking at the way they dress or the, the way they smell or the way they eat their food or the way they're walking. And, and you don't need to really talk to them, but sometimes there are, you're drawn to strangers um, because somehow your curiosity overcomes fear of the mm -hmm. other, right? This othering, we talked about othering um, in the previous chat. And this othering issue is really disturbs me that if there was no such word as stranger, so I'm coming into this whole situation saying from Mongolia to Bulgaria down to Tata, we're all connected genetically, there's a connection. And as much as you were once a stranger to me, if I had a brother show up in my life suddenly or a sibling, they're also strangers. I mean, just because they're born in the same yeah. house, they, they yeah. can all have completely different personalities and likes and dislikes, and they might even look different. Hmm. So they're, they're, they're as much strangers as some Joe Smith on the street. Mm -hmm. If we were to remove the word stranger from the dictionary, then what would happen? It, it's not, a, it's not, I like it, like almost any word, it's not a precise word, I think. So, um, and you know, the way we use it differs depending on the, depending mm. on the circumstances and because language is always deliciously kind of um, sloppy and messy. Um, but I think the, I mean, the thing I really um, want to kind of respond to is that thing you're saying about the pleasure of finding yourself amongst strangers. Um, yeah. And there is something, um, I mean, immensely, immensely kind of liberating about that. I mean, I can remember being in Pakistan one night and I was staying in a really kind of really cheap, really, really cheap hotel, I think in Bahawalpur. Um, and I went out at night into the, into the bazaar and I had my shawar kameez on and I had my nice big wool blanket pulled over my head and I was walking through the bazaar and nobody were, you know, nobody was like, ah, oh, because, you know, I was pretty much invisible because um, I was all wrapped up and it was dark and no, nobody was speaking to me. So I didn't have to betray myself with my, um, you know, um, a few words of Urdu. And um, I remember just walking through the darkness there and there were people cooking things and, you know, there were merchants and that kind of thing. And feeling almost this sort of intense bodily physical bliss at being amongst strangers and there being something kind of quite freeing about that. And it's one of the things the 19th century sociologist George Simmel um, talks about, how that relationship with strangers, the proximity and the distance, which he says, and that's how he defines strangers. They're close, but they're also, we feel them to be distant. Um, and he says that's always a positive relationship which i don't think it is but very often it is i think and there's something really positive about that as an experience i wonder when it would not be a positive experience because you sit in buses really close to random strangers barely inches away we fly in aircrafts where suddenly uh you know people who are fussy about you know speaking to a woman or speaking to a man or looking at them or talking to them or shaking their hands suddenly they're stuck next to you, like barely two inches away, and they have to deal with it. And all those uh, social structures collapse. I think air airplanes are really, really interesting, at least the economy section of it, because you're, you're stuck <laughs> like sardines together, and then all your sort of um, social quirks that you sort of find yourself being privileged to have to be put down and put aside and kind of checked in at the door um, like dirty shoes and you just have to like get on with it and suddenly none of those things matter anymore and people do end up striking conversations with folks who they would never do otherwise on the street or even in somebody's home over invited dinner they'd probably sit in one corner and be like Ugh. you know they'd be, they'd be snobby about something
But in the aircraft, whether you need to borrow a pen to fill out one of your forms or, um, you know, so this, it, it's very bizarre. So the anonymity of strangers, you know, that would be such a great piece of history to look into because back to you and me finding ourselves in a caravansarai, <laughs> getting some food in Kabul, I only speak Urdu, you only speak English, and we're stuck in a third country where they don't speak either Urdu or English. <clears throat> We'd have to find food, and then we're going from Kabul up to Samarkand, um, mm -hmm. you know, that whole journey, and the kinds of people. So the clothing, we haven't talked about fashion much so far. Mm -hmm. Clothing is important, and once you're covered, I think if you walked around in your trousers and T-shirt, maybe you would have attracted some attention back in those days. But you were a shalwar oh, and a chadar. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I remember I wore sh shalwar kameez all the time. And um, then I got to Raul Pindi and I was going to Islamabad to go to the Chinese embassy to try and get a visa, to try and go through the Kuntra Pass. Um, and for the first time, I put trousers and a shirt on. And it was clear that I was a white guy in the shalwar kameez, but the clothing kind of um, was enough to sort of si signify that I wasn't, um, um, you know, that pe people didn't need to worry about me. But the moment I put a shirt and trousers on because I was going to the embassy, um, people were like, oh, you know, hello, hello, hello. And, you know, um, and suddenly there was all kinds of interest. Um, so I, I do think that's, I mean, I think I, I'm, I've never been a great fashionista, but I'm really fascinated by the way clothes signify um and um the way kind of clothing is a is a social kind of as an anthropologist you know i love the the way clothing is a kind of social signaling thing as well and it structures our relationships Absolutely. so it breaks boundaries or it creates barriers <laughs> right so either you're yeah. anonymous in bahawalpur and they think you're one of the guys or you suddenly yeah. become somebody that you need to serve because you're the white man in Islamabad and obviously therefore we must serve you because um, that's and, what we've been taught for 300 years, right? Um, yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and the, the kind of reverse, say, for example, in the UK and particularly France, um, the moral panic around the hijab and, um, yeah. and all yeah. What do you think about that? Because that's also very strong social signals. Uh, clothing plays a huge role, even color. Um, not only what you show and what you wear, but the color that you wear, whether it's white or it's black or it's flashy or it's glitzy. Um, mm -hmm. I've learned so much of this, Will, by wearing shalwar kameezes on these tours of mine. I mean, you've seen pictures. Yeah. I didn't own any shalwar kameezes when you and I were younger and we were friends. This is something I've had to develop recently since I've come back and rediscovered, starting to rediscover my roots. Um, and it's incredible you how you much that wear that. Me. So I wear this, I don't wear a silly hat, I wear, wear this. A fancy, fancy hat, yeah. Uh, I wear this, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, and I, to be honest, this right, is just, right. it's stupid. I wear it because of my haircut and the, the, these bits, if I wore a silly yeah. hat, this doesn't work. My hair has to be much shorter for a local yeah. hat. So yeah. I can wear this and get away with the pseudo Indiana yeah. Jones look. Uh, yeah, it's good. It works and it keeps it, you know, also the little Indian, the Cindy hat doesn't give me um, sun yeah, yeah, yeah. So it gives me a little bit of canopy, which is great. But the access to culture, mm. right? The access to stories, you, you, I sort of feel like we get brought into the fold a lot easier if you make a crappy attempt at looking like your host. Right, so they, they give you credit for that. That, okay, at least he's made an effort, let's bring him in and feed him inside. And, and that dissolves their fear of you. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, I mean, that was very noticeable for me most recently in Myanmar, where I started wearing the longi. Um, and in Myanmar, pretty much you can wear the longi anywhere. And it's business dress. And when I was teaching, um, in the postgraduate institute, I would teach in longi and bare feet. And for the first maybe six weeks, I was like, well, who am I to wear this? And what's, what are the cultural politics? And, you know, is this cultural appropriation? And then my Burmese friends were like, no, nah, no, nah, it'll look good. You know, get one and we'll show you how to tie it. Um, and the moment I put one on, I did feel people responded differently to me. But the weird thing as well, um, and I is that I felt my Burmese got better. 
And that was really odd. So I went to get a taxi and, you know, normally I'd be kind of stumbling and awkward and would feel myself an outsider. Um, but, you know, I put on the laundry and I go to a taxi and I'm like, ah, I call. And then suddenly I would just, because I was physically embodying, you know, how um, Burmese people sort of dress and, and move as well, because you move in a particular way. Yes. Suddenly my sort of actions and gestures and my use of language felt more natural. And that was really weird and fascinating, I think. That makes sense. You know, that's like masks. You put yeah. on a mask, you yeah. put on something that belongs to somebody else. And that and the theatrics of it gives you mm -hmm. that personality, that persona and more confidence. You know, really, there's two, two statements that I'm going to quickly draw your attention to. I don't want to lose <laughs> them. One, Adnan has just said uh, during the Raj, the, att the attire of the Nawab was made the uniform of the doorman so that the humiliation of the local ruler being, being made to bow to the Gora ruler was enough psychological subjugation. You know, that's really crazy, crazy as shit. That's just unbelievable. Yeah. And, yeah, and all Jean of... has a question for you. What about written poetry? Um, I love written poetry. Um, not all of it, but I love written poetry. And um, I don't write it these days. I used to, I used to write it. I quite often um, find an excuse to translate poetry from Chinese because I, I love doing that from classical Chinese. Um, the thing I find, I don't know if it's the same in poetry circles, um, say in Pakistan or in, uh, you know, it, it's Jean, so is it in, in the States? There's a kind of yeah. rift, there's a rift between the oral poetry world and the um, and the written poetry world, which I find I find a shame actually because it's all doing stuff with words and um, you know we should we should um, get on better with <laughs> with each other um, the people who are doing that. The thing I think about dress and subjugation and um, power and hierarchy and how that's kind of played out, you know, it's played out in, colonial, in the colonial era, but also how it's played out in um, sort of very everyday circumstances where any situation where power is at stake, I think it's really interesting. And I'm kind of conscious that it's um, four minutes to nine over here in Bulgaria, and that we were going to talk a little more, um, talk a little more about some of those kind of issues to do with, particularly the sort of post-colonial legacy off. Um, I might come back and talk about that more later. I think we're going to have to call you back. Uh, maybe next Thursday we can have we can continue this part Hello. too because I do want to continue that conversation. And, you know, this hour has gone by really quickly, but I guess you and I also had so much to catch up on. But you know, Willie, you you also now have an idea of what kinds of things we want to talk about, and so I don't have to badger you with it. Um, I think let's pick up on this. If you can keep in mind, maybe not next Thursday because that's somebody else coming in, but the Thursday after. It'll of be another yeah. Thursday time. Let's continue this. Uh, for today, I'm going to say thank yeah. you so much. Beg my leave. I will say for the office to you from Karachi. Aap apna khayal rakhega, please. Summer, enjoy kare. Uh, Urdu apni practice karte rahe. Sofia, Bulgaria mein Urdu ki aapko zuhat padegi. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Will. That's been amazing. Uh, so nice to see you. Blagata, so nice to talk to you. Take care of yourself. Yeah. So good to see you. <laughs> Love you. Bye. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. <laughs> Cheers. And yes, again, mate. Yeah. Bye.